we'll just start off like how are you doing now um, with the COVID? Like how are things going with you? You know, things have been going pretty well. I've been really lucky and fortunate in that so far it hasn't really impacted my business too much. Um, I've got a couple of bigger clients that have kept me fairly busy on the hemp side, which is kind of moving forward. And then, um, you know, I've done some work to try to get some COVID-19 resources out to like folks here in the Washington uh, adult use industry. Um, so, you know, it's been interesting to see that sort of scramble, but I already worked from home. Um, you know, the biggest impact is I haven't been traveling like I was at this time last year. And, you know, here in Washington, cannabis was deemed essential. So, you know, the stores have been open. Um, kind of been watching, you know, what's happened with that. I think, uh, you know, it's been good and bad in that it's great to see the industry be essential, but I think it's also had an impact on businesses and that, um, you know, uh, the demand has just changed. Uh, weekends aren't big. They aren't able to do events and promotions. I mean, obviously things like 420 didn't really amount to too much. Even we just had the 710 holiday, which, you know, so I think uh, people have been steady, but maybe not as seasonally busy as they might've been. I know here in Washington, uh, we experienced a big bump in the summertime with tourism, which, you know, isn't going to happen. So, so it's, you know, uh, definitely had some impact in terms of, um, you know, people trying to figure out how to adjust to this reality. It's definitely good to know you're doing well. And uh, yeah, like you, just me and my family adjusting to these uncertain times and getting used to working from home, which has its benefits and of course, disadvantages. So you, um, Matthew, you have Think Happy Consulting. Uh, so tell us, tell us about that. And um, especially how'd you come up with the name? Think Happy Consulting, I started about almost two years ago now. Um, kind of out of my experiences in the adult use market here in Washington State uh, and sort of needing, seeing an, uh, a need for sort of more regular business support. Um, so I started a consulting business that was really focused on compliance and workplace safety. Um, now as that has evolved over time, I'm starting to include things like good manufacturing practices uh, as I start to see that become more part of the industry. The name, I really kind of wanted to try to do a little bit of a clever play off of something cannabis related. So Think Happy Consulting is THC and, um, you know, something to maybe get away from the typical canna, this, or, you know, those things that are, are you know, more, maybe more recognizable, but, um, you know, just wanted to try to come up with something a little bit clever there. So, so what were you doing prior to um, uh, starting the consultancy? Came here to Washington State in 2015 to work in the adult use market. I was uh, recruited to come open up a retail store in Squim, Washington. I live out in Port Angeles, just past Squim, about two and a half hours northwest of Seattle. And uh, I had an opportunity to come and do that. And then that led to another opportunity to manage a uh, tier three grow here in Washington, a 30,000 square foot. Uh, kind of as an operations manager, and then they got taken over by a larger entity, and I ended up in a bigger role with those guys. Uh, and through that experience, I realized that there was a lot of emphasis on certain areas within the industry, you know, cultivation, even here in Washington, because there isn't vertical integration, I mean, figuring out packaging and, and you know, supply chain issues, but there were certain things that really weren't getting any attention. And prior to joining the cannabis industry, I had done safety for a municipality uh, in New Mexico. And so I had really become, you know, familiar with OSHA rules and how all that worked. And through some experiences I had, I thought, you know, this is something that nobody's really paying any attention to in the industry because it's so new and young. Um, so there might be some opportunity to try to get, you know, provide some services to these kind of folks to help them get themselves compliant with things like safety. Um, you know, uh, with also an understanding of the actual ins and outs of the cannabis industry. Um, I was really fortunate to get, you know, in a pretty quick arc here in Washington to go from getting to be part of opening a retail store to running a grow operation and delivering products to lots of stores and then being part of a, a much larger entity that was really trying to figure out how to produce enough cannabis to feed their successful brand. Um, and so that really was a, a you know, a very, um, uh, educational <laughs> two or three years in terms of how the industry works and then understanding, you know, how things like safety and compliance work um, gave me, you know, like I said, the kind of a, a seeing that niche that could be filled. You started in 2018. And if so, how'd the first year go for you? You know, actually pretty well. I was lucky to, you know, through a lot of networking here in the state, get some work in terms of, you know, 
finding the folks that needed safety plans and then also started writing some SOPs along the way for some different extraction processes. For people who haven't heard, what's the SOP? Standard operating procedures. Uh, so, you know, yeah, you know, like the employee manuals and all that. So I've done a lot of that work now along the way too, um, which I love because it gives me the opportunity to really learn more in depth about a lot of how the processes work. Um, and there's a certain creativity that goes along with all that that, you know, I enjoy too. Um, and, it, it, and it's really given me the opportunity to see a lot of different operations and how people do things. You know, the cannabis community is somewhat small and there's this opportunity to network. I do a lot of stuff with the Cannabis Alliance here in Washington, which is a, a trade group I belong to. Um, and then through some traded shows and stuff here, I was able to make some, some early connections. And then um, in early 2019, I got a big uh, customer on the hemp side. I work with a, a big hemp dryer company. And I've helped do a lot of the documentations and trainings and, and stuff. So that really kind of brought me into the hemp side of things, which is, you know, what happened last year in hemp was unlike anything I've really ever experienced in that sort of uh, gold rush mentality that was happening. And, um, you know, this year is much different, but um, that's really taken up a lot of my time in the last year. What are some, um, you know, characteristics of the sector in Washington and maybe how do you think it compares to Colorado? And I know you mentioned tier three and you mentioned vertical integration. So I'm just curious how these things also come into play. You know, Washington is much different than some of the other states that have an adult use market. Uh, when they started the program here, they, unlike others that just sort of rolled over the medical stores into adult use stores or, or combined them, um, and have vertical integration. And vertical integration is uh, growing and selling uh, your own product through your own store. So here in Washington, that's against the law. So growers are, and process, you know, what we call processors are usually extraction or people that package and, uh, you know, produce a product. But here in Washington, everything comes in its own individual package. There are no jars in stores that you look at and, and weigh it out in a store. Um, and so that has created kind of its own different beast in that, um, you know, as a producer, you're fighting for shelf space in a store. You don't automatically have an outlet to sell your products um, through a retail brand. So, you know, there's a lot of hustling that goes on in the state to try to produce that. Um, and then that this has really led to a different kind of competition, I think, here. It's not so much, and, and at the same time, you're limited in the number of store licenses you can have. So there's no 22, 25 store chains in Washington. You've seen people start to, you know, create licensing deals and, and co-brand and do some different creative ways. But even those stores are in the, like, six to maybe eight range. Um, and, and they, again, don't have vertical integration. So, so I think that's just kind of created a little bit different uh, unique way in that branding is really, really important here. Um, you know, packaging is really, really important here. Um, but I think it's also created a, a lot of really competition that creates a lot of great products for consumers also. Um, it's kind of overwhelming when you walk into a retail store in Washington, I think, um, because there's so much choice and so much great packaging and so much kind of going on. I know it's really why bud tenders end up being so important in all this because when a consumer, you know, uh, somebody comes in the door, they're really going to rely on those folks to make recommendations here, in, especially in Washington, because you, you can look at it in the jar, but you don't get to smell it. Um, you know, some of those little differences that people aren't used to. Now, what I've experienced over time is that they're, you know, the price point where it is these days and, you just have a kind of a low risk opportunity to try a lot of different things. And so I think people have sort of moved past not being able to smell it um, and realize that, you know, when you're paying $10 for a good quality gram of cannabis, uh, that even if you don't love it, that risk was fairly low. Uh, and you can try several different things. What about the hemp industry in uh, Washington? Is it fairly large or has it been around for a long time? Or? Um, they started under the 2014 in some limited capacity. They really expanded the law. But they, but one of the big caveats here in Washington is they couldn't be within, and I think, two or three miles of a licensed cannabis grow because of the potential for you know pollination. They stripped that rule out last year. Um, and so now they can plant hemp anywhere. Um, I think it's, you know, just like everywhere, there's definitely interest here, but I think uh, it's a, you know, the world is still fairly split. Um, I think some cannabis farmers are 
seeing the benefit of, of having a separate hemp line, you know, of having a hemp company where they can produce CBD and, and then, you know, now, uh, you know, here in Washington, you can bring CBD that's produced in other places as long as it's tested and passes everything. You can bring that within the system. Um, so there's some, definitely see some brands taking advantage of that. I don't think, uh, you know, unlike, say, Oregon or Colorado, maybe North Carolina that really jumped on it early, uh, Washington is a little bit more in the middle. Um, but I do see, especially in the eastern part of the state where most of the sun-grown crops are produced, uh, once you get on the other side of the Cascades, you know, there's a lot of potential within the agriculture there. Um, but I've really had the opportunity to see hemp on a national level. And it, 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 it's, you know, even though last year was fairly disastrous for a lot of folks, uh, and that the price has gone down significantly <laughs> uh, for biomass, for extracts, all that, because of, you know, the glut on the market and a lot of things, but only about 50% was even harvested. You know, you've got folks that are planting in a lot of different ways. They're getting advice in a lot of different ways. Guys that are row crop farmers like corn and soy, you know, saw the opportunity when, you know, uh, <laughs> biomass pays. Biomass pricing is based on the uh, potency. And so, you know, what you grow is worth as much CBD by point. And at one point, that price was like $4.25 a point. It's like 80 cents right now. Wow. It's probably going to hit 40 um, uh, as a bottom because uh, people are still sitting on stuff. So uh, it's also sort of like, I mean, hemp is, is such a bigger thing. Like you're really, and that's what I've really learned. And that's kind of what's holding it back in some ways is that uh, they're getting a lot of advice from the cannabis world, which is grow these big Christmas tree style plants and do all these things to get big, beautiful flowers. Well, there's no equipment out there that really deals well with that. So what I've learned in the last couple of years is you're, you're talking about using combines with equipment to sort in the field and chop this stuff. And, you know, the dryer guys I work with, these are machines that do between 15, uh, up to 15,000 pounds an hour. Hemp understands that they are looking, uh, anybody that, that is really looking at this, they want an FDA approved product at some point. And to get an FDA approved product that means your facility has to be built in a certain way you know that's where good manufacturing practices and good agricultural practices all start to come into play and i feel like you know the adult use because it it's come up the way it has they never thought that they were necessarily trying to get an fda approved product and so you know in my experience at a lot of adult use places you're kind of lucky to see them using food grade stuff um, and not just a regular old generic plastic bin. I'm sure as you see on the safety side, you know, it's this sort of lack of understanding of detail, I think that <clears throat> really hurts them and that, you know, thinking that organic means it's safe. Thinking that, you know, if I don't think, it, if it's organic, it's not a pesticide. Um, you know, not taking certain things seriously. And I've learned from the hemp side that adult use cannabis, there's gonna come a time, you know, when this stuff is gonna be legal and there's going to be a really big barrier for a lot of folks to make that investment uh, to get their facility and their operation up to a standard that would, you know, be legal in, in the future. I mean, I always say this is the, you know, and it's already passed and that this is the most fun it's ever going to be and that, you know, the rules are what they are, but there's only more rules coming. I was at a sh uh, trade show last October in Las Vegas and they had a regional director from the EPA there which is the first time a federal official had ever spoke at a hemp related event. And his message was welcome to the party. The rules are coming, you know? So I think it's, that's always kind of been my message on the safety side is this is another risk that your company is facing and regulators, uh, you know, everybody's so focused on traceability, track and trace, that portion of regulation that they forget <laughs> that they're, you know, just as, um, responsible to follow the rules for workplace safety and you know and that's where they start to get themselves into trouble and where i see you know that's where i do see adult use um struggle because they may be able to pass everything with a a, a regular safety guy but when an industrial hygienist gets into the facility they start to get into real problems have you been following that movement to try to reduce the 0.3 to 0.1? And what do you think about that? I wish that exact same amount of effort was just going in to get it in uh, THC descheduled mm -hmm. completely. 
and just to give people the free reign to choose to grow what they want to grow based on what consumers want to consume. Uh, that's my, what, what I would like to see the effort go into. Unfortunately, I think that there, you know, I, I just saw a thing yesterday in Colorado, actually, where uh, there's a group that's upset about a consultant that was hired to oversee the center of excellence model. Um, you know, there's still a little bit of that divide where I know hemp people that are adamant that they do not grow marijuana. They need to believe that to do their business the way that they do it. And so I think that's part of it. You know, there's, uh, um, and at the same time, I've been at plenty of places where I, I see a guy who works in the adult use industry come to a hemp facility and, and almost get physically sick because there's piles of biomass on tarps. There's, you know, it's, it's a whole different type of operation. And I 100% get both sides. I have a huge reverence for the plant. I've been part of that. And I've also, you know, swept cannabinoids up off the floor to send out for extraction because they have that much value. But I've also seen what it looks like to try to harvest 200 acres of hemp that's ready to go at the same time and dry it and secure it. And that's not something you do by hand and hanging it, <laughs> you know? So getting to see the spectrum of that, it's really interesting, you know, hopefully there'll be more interaction. Cause what I say is that, you know, the folks on the adult use side have all the knowledge about how to maximize production of the plant. You know, and, and I even say, look at Sea Green and stuff. These guys that are growing big, you know, that's not how you get the most cannabinoids, you know. And, and there's a lot of cool uh, stuff happening. I mean, starting to see genetics that are specifically meant to be a mix of, um, you know, maybe like 6% cannabinoids, but also you're going to purposely get a seed product out of that and get a fiber herd product out of that. And, and plant it like a row crop, you know, in a close cover situation. So there's a lot of advances being made. Tell us about what you feel, uh, what are two or more of the key health and safety issues that you found in Washington State? Well, I think the biggest issue really is just, you know, a, a lack of training. I think that, you know, um, and even from my own experience, a lot of the times by the time somebody brings somebody on board, they've, they've already needed them for two weeks. And so they don't take the time to put them through like an orientation and, you know, uh, the worker protection standard training, if they're going to be around pesticides and all these different little things that um, just sort of get bypassed in the hurry to get people to work. Um, and so that's one of the things I really focus on is, you know, we've got a great orientation training that we provide to people when we set up programs for them um, and follow that up with some other trainings to go along with their safety meetings. Um, but that's, you know, the other issue I see that I think the industry needs to sort of get its head around is, is air quality. Um, you know, the number one question I got when I was managing businesses is, what am I breathing in? And, you know, anybody that's been in the industry at a significant level understands that, that things like powdery mildew and botrytis, they're, they're very common. Um, and, you know, not to mention potential pesticides and all that. So, um, I think there's some good work that's being done to kind of understand, you know, it's an interesting mix. E even what do, does long-term exposure to this level of terpenes, volatile organic compounds, do to somebody? You know, we don't have a lot of data on some of that stuff. Um, so, so I think that's something that, you know, um, people need to kind of get their head around. It, it's sort of funny because, well, not funny, but um, because often the answer to that question is just wear a mask right? Like wear an N95 mask when you're processing stuff and just err on the side of, of not, you know, irritating somebody. As, uh, you know, it's been pointed out, a lot of fo these folks are also smokers, right? So you're going to have a slightly compromised respiratory system to begin with <laughs> if you do consume every day or on a regular basis. And then, you know, you add these other things. So, so, and then you go into spaces that don't really maybe have adequate ventilation, especially in processing areas. I mean, I've been, you know, in a scene, you know, 15 people packed into a little room packaging pre-rolls, mm. you know, and they're all masked and they've all got, you know, but they have to change out the filter in the air conditioner in there every day. Is there any kind of state mandate that says there's a required training for employees or you don't see anything like that? Well, it is. I mean, that's sort of the frustrating side of safety. I think that it's all required, right? Um, but, but it's not required that you demonstrate you're doing it to get into business. And so people usually don't find out about the safety requirements of their state until they have an injury or an inspection that results in a fine. Um, and so I think, you know, Personally, I would love to see, show us your safety plan as part of getting a business license. 
right? Because it is the law. If you have a single employee in the state of Washington, you're required to have a safety plan. Um, you're, you're supposed to identify the hazards in your workplace and come up with a plan of how they're not going to get hurt. Um, but but you know, the reality of that is a little bit different. You've got folks that are exposed from anything from large amounts of very flammable alcohol to a lot of CO2 that if it's not properly vented, you cause problems. And then, of course, hydrocarbon extraction, where you've got uh, explosive gases under pressure. Um, and so, you know, really those facilities, depending on what you're doing, should be built in a particular way. And the way that the laws were set up in the beginning, they, they had the uh, fire department be the people that permit these systems and kind of decide if they're okay without bringing in, say, labor and industries here in Washington to do that kind of an inspection. Every extraction system is a little mini refinery. And if you look at how they run big refineries and big chemical extraction, you know, it's that process. And really it's a matter of uh, setting up, you know, standard operation procedures for who's going to do maintenance and who's going to do the regular sort of stuff. When you look into the accidents that happen in extraction, they're usually related to a five cent nut that wasn't replaced, wasn't torqued correctly, you know, it, it's those kind of maintenance issues that are causing the problems. And that's because it, it goes back to that lack of understanding of, of that there's systems out there to help you figure out how to do this already. Who would be in the trainings that you've done in the past? And then what would you say the, uh, the individuals that, that participate, what do they get out of it? What, what's the main like take home message you think they get out of it? Yeah, I've done trainings at a lot of different facilities, uh, both retail and producer processor. Um, you know, I think their concerns are always a little bit different. Like I said, I think on the producer processor side, a lot of it is around things like air quality and those kinds of exposures. So, um, you know, training people on things like PPE and understanding that it's okay to ask your employer for a mask if they need to give you that. And, um, you know, it's okay to ask to be trained. I think that's one of the big things with training is letting folks know that every time you get asked to do something new in your job, you should be trained first on how to safely do that. Um, if they bring a new chemical in, right? You want to be trained. So I think raising awareness amongst employees that they do have some some room to ask some questions, and that you know, um, and I like I always try to tell them, that here's what's going to happen if you have an incident. They're going to split the employees off, and they're going to ask them, what's on this label? What are you supposed to do if you get this in your eye? And they should be able to answer that question, right? You know, both to protect your business, but for their own safety too. So. That's where I see a lot of benefit in the training for employees is really just kind of opening their eyes to the fact that um, they have some rights and some, um, you know, and employers have a responsibility to them. So, and, and just hearing their concerns sometimes, I think, you know, unfortunately, because the industry, you know, the perception is that we're all billionaires. The reality is that most folks are not making any money They're you know, they do it because they love it. And, you know, somewhere in there that gets lost and, um, I think a lot of owners operators are so focused on trying to keep their businesses afloat um, that it's sometimes perceived that they don't care about these things. And, and it's not that they don't care. It's just that they are, you know, trying to make payroll that week. Right. Um, but I think having things like trainings, having safety meetings, having, you know, showing those kind of things, that's a way you can show employees that you do care <laughs> and, and help get them, you know, invested in kind of creating that culture of safety. You also have created a couple of visual images or graphics to help with your um, your training. So tell us about one that you found the most interesting. I worked with a friend to create a poster uh, just to kind of help people understand how to get started um, and to kind of lay out, you know, in a way how complicated it sort of is uh, in that, you know, as an employer, uh, you have a certain set of responsibilities. And so the way I kind of set up that poster was to kind of follow down if you're doing different activities, you know, what sort of, you know, plans you might be required to have. Um, but, you know, here within the cannabis industry, it's, if you're doing production, you know, you really need to look at things like labels to understand, you know, everybody's going to have your basic safety plan, accident prevention plan. Um, but in this industry, you know, things like uh, respiratory plans, um, respirators are a big thing, right? If you have a respirator at your facility right now and you don't have a written plan, haven't done medical fit and fit testing, that's a violation, right? Mm -hmm. Because you're not supposed to have them there if you're not doing these other things. And, and so for people to kind of really look at, you know, that's what I've been trying to raise awareness about. You know, it's not, I don't want it to be overwhelming 
too overwhelming, but I wanted it to be overwhelming enough that people would try to take it more seriously. I think the next one I'm sort of working on is to directly more at workers specifically. Um, this one is more for employers, but just to kind of get them aware of what they, you know, could be thinking about um, and help protect themselves. With your work with uh, Think Happy Consulting, uh, do you like your job? I love my job. Uh, you know, it's very challenging at times, but to be part of, you know, these emerging industries, I, I feel very lucky uh, to have been able to take something that I am passionate about, which is cannabis and hemp, and and to, you know, kind of found a niche within that. and. When I got here to Washington in 2015, I was excited about this little opportunity, but I really had no idea what I was getting into. Um, and when I went to my first professional trade organization meeting and really saw a room full of, of professionals, you know, not just cannabis people, but people that were looking to build an industry, you know, the light really went off in my head that, wow, you know, pay attention to what's going on. Um, and then I, you know, I've just, for the most part, said yes to all the crazy things that have been in front of me since then. And, you know, just continue to try to figure it out and move forward. So, so yeah, I love my job. What advice would you have for individuals who want a job that you have? There are definitely underserved areas within the industry, you know, and there's a lot of room for folks that have regular business skills to do really well in this industry. You don't need to be a grower. You don't need to want to trim cannabis. You don't need to want to be an extractor. What we, what, in my opinion, holds this industry back more than anything are folks with just regular business skills. So if, if you are interested in this industry and you are an office manager, there's opportunity for you. <laughs> um, you know, if you're good, if you work in a government agency right now and you know how to read rules and regulations and you, you know, and you're curious, then, then get into it because folks that have these kinds of skills, it's, it's gold, right? Guys that are great at growing cannabis, there's more of them being made every day in that, you know, every operation now has a lot of employees that are learning how to be really good at growing cannabis. Um, and so, so I would say don't feel like you're limited to, you know, these sort of what I call sexy things within the industry. You can be an accountant and have an amazing practice. In this industry. You can be, uh, you know, like me, you can write manuals and say, you know, there's a, there's a niche out there. And an opportunity to really love, like, love what you're doing. And, and because it's so new, I've been doing this for five years now. I thought we'd have it kind of figured out. If you're looking for a bridge, join on the hemp side. That's 100% legal, right? You don't have to, you know, worry about maybe that stigma that still comes along with being in the cannabis industry.